Um, cool. And for those of you who are just filtering in, um, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, that would be great so that the Gore team can hear where people are coming from and names and all that. Um, yeah, we'll get started. Um, I'm just going to do a quick, inter or quick uh, intro. This is Lee's the person I've been working with at Cortex, and she's brought a whole team of folks tonight to talk to us about Cortex as a material, all the differences, the science of comfort, if those, as they call it, which I think is so great. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to them, but uh, we'll go for about an hour this evening, and they're going to do some slides and um, show us lots of data and cool photos and videos and things like that. Um, and then towards the end of the evening, we'll take questions and answers. So again, if you have any questions and answer, or if you have any questions, <laughs> um, you can drop those in the chat, and I'll try and keep track of those so that we can address them at the end of the night. Um, that's all I have. Lee, do you want to take it? Yeah, sure. Um, if anybody does have answers, that'd be awesome too. So hi everyone. Um, so I'm here with the Gore-Tex brand um, and I just wanted to set kind of set the stage and introduce you to the team that will be kind of the team of experts for tonight. Um, I get the pleasure of working with all four of these folks and it's great. Um, so here tonight with us, we have um, Dan Cawthorn, and Dan Cawthorn's been a account manager, field sales associate with Gore for 25 years now. Um, that's him right here. We also have Ray Davis, a 21-year associate. 15 of those have been in the comfort and durability lab as a technician. Um, he's basically the guy running the comfort chamber that you'll hear all about in a second. We also have Christy Haywood. She's an application engineer for Gore-Tex Garments, um, and she's on the fabric and product development side. She works a lot with top North American outdoor brands. Um, some of them include Arcteryx, for an example, um, and she's been with Gore for 26 years now. And then last but not least, we have Sarah Ellis. She's a product specialist within Gore's consumer fabrics business. Um, and she champions the product strategy for garments. So she really leads the efforts for the Gore-Tex Pro Techno Technology category. Um, and she was also just recently elected to the Board of Outdoor Industry Association. So pretty cool. Um, and then last but not least, my name's Lee. I'm just part of the marketing team and I get the pleasure of working with all of these awesome folks here at Gore. So I'm gonna pass it to Dan and he's gonna kind of kick us off for the night. Great. Great. Well, thanks everybody. And um, for the whole team here, you know, we're thrilled to be able to do this because uh, um, in our world of making Gore-Tex jackets, um, having people safe in the mountains is really important. And uh, one of the ways we do that is through um, studying of uh, comfort. It kind of sounds funny, but that's what we do and we call it comfort science. So what we want to do today is um, is help share with you um, what it is, what comfort science is, and, and get a basic understanding of it and how Gore uses it to um, develop our, our products for outdoor garments and mostly so you can make some informed decisions about your own equipment. Because you know what you're gonna be doing, and, and well, should back up, you know, worked for Gore 25 years and since a teenager, I've been a backcountry skier and ice climber and climber and all that and taking quite a few avalanche courses over the years and uh, all those activities you know have extreme um, stop start challenges right you work really hard whether it's you know um, skinning up a slope or or digging an avalanche pit get really sweaty and then you stop and cool off and um, often for quite a while and often in really bad weather too so being able to be comfortable comfortable in all those conditions and different um, physiological demands is is the key to you being able to do your job right and do it safely. So that's where the idea of comfort is safety comes from. So that's what we wanna do, um, uh, help learn about how bodies work so you can dress appropriately and do your job better. So um, let's hand it over to Ray and he'll get going on uh, the science, thermal comfort. There we go. Thanks, thanks Dan. Um, so yeah, we're going to mostly talk about thermal comfort tonight. There's many different aspects of comfort. There's acoustic, aesthetics, uh, there's everything that you can think of, but it, it really breaks down to thermal comfort um, from what most of the work that we do here at Gore for uh, um, our testing in the cold regions, right? So what your body's trying to do is stay at homeostasis. 
uh, as much as possible. We're not 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and if you can do that, you're going to be comfortable. Um, so it's pretty much trying to equal out that heat production and heat loss on this balance scale. Now, there are consequences to this if you are not able to do that. The first of what's being is discomfort. When you get too hot or too cold, you start to sweat or you overheat. Uh, from there, you get into performance where you can start seeing some of your cognitive skills um, start to deteriorate. And from there, you start talking into survival. Um, you know, on the hot side, you can start talking about heat stroke. Um, and on the cold side, obviously, you, you know, you start talking about um, hypothermia or freezing to death and what you have there. So most of these slides that we're going to go through next um, all break down to these equations. Uh, we're going to go through these pretty heavy handedly, give you guys a, a really good uh, understanding of all of these. Uh, there will be a quiz at the end for the Q&A, so be, get ready for that. Now, obviously, um, I'm kidding around there. Uh, that's pretty much a joke. Um, it all breaks down to heat production minus the heat loss equals your heat storage, whether that's going to be a positive heat storage um, in heat strain or a negative heat storage when you're in cold strain. Uh, Christy's going to get into that a little bit more um, in her slides when she's talking about the male to female physiology. Um, from there, we get into the mechanisms of heat loss um, and how we can control them. So the human body um, is what it is. There's not much we can do to re-engineer it. God has designed it however he has, and it's going to stay that way. Uh, we can't change that. Uh, the same goes for the environment that we're in. Unless there's some shelters nearby, you can't really change that. The only thing that we can control is the clothing that we're wearing. So um, when you're talking about heat loss and the mechanisms with the clothing, we're trying to keep the body from the convection, uh, the conduction, the radiation, and the evaporation. Uh, and that really breaks down to some quick examples of touching hot, cold objects, wind chill, solar, um, evaporation. When you stop exercising, you start to feel that post-exercise chill when your metabolic rate is still high. Um, so we're, we're trying to create scenarios and, and end uses where we can control that as much as possible. And that basically breaks down to uh, insulation and moisture transport control. Uh, we'll talk about insulation first, right? So insulation is really the human body we're trying to trap air layers around the body as much as possible. That's still air layer that you can control around the air, around the body is going to be that insulation that is protecting you. Now, and it's important to remember that insulation works both ways, right? So um, whether you're in a warmer ambient than your body or a cooler ambient than your body, um, we're trying to keep that homeostasis as, as consistent as possible. Uh, obviously, we're not gonna be repelling down into some liquid hot magma, um, and some of these avalanche, avalanche rescues, well, at least I hope we're not, um, we're going to be closer to our buddy here in the Christmas story, all bundled up and, and layering and, and trying to understand the proper layering uh, is very important because um, it doesn't take a lot of moisture inside the system to really affect the performance of the insulation that you're wearing. So when you think about Gore-Tex, uh, you think about waterproofness, right? So we're, if we're doing our job properly, we're keeping the water from getting into your system. Uh, Lee, if you can go into the next slide, right? So very minimal amounts of water can really affect the performance of your insulation. Um, and the closer you put yourself at risk of cold illness or injury. So what we need to do is make sure we're protecting the body from the outside as well as the inside. Because once we get into layering, you have a very good chance of heating up um, at higher metabolic outputs, and you start to sweat. And that's where we start talking about moisture transport um, and what happens when the body starts to sweat. So here's a real quick uh, cartoon of, you know, what we all know what happens when the skin temperature starts to increase. Then you go, or, yeah, thank you, Lee. Um, skin temperature starts to increase, you start to sweat, right? And that sweat is going to evaporate off the skin. Now, our goal is to move that moisture vapor through the clothing system as fast and quickly as possible. If you're able to do that, you're in a good scenario um, and not having that moisture build up and condense inside your insulation. If you're in an impermeable clothing, that's where you can start to get into trouble and have your insulation start to soak up some of that moisture. So it's really critical to the comfort and performance for you when, um, when you're in the field to make sure that you're wearing the correct layering system for your ended end use, or at least have the ability to make adjustments on the fly. 
from there we get into what is my favorite question, what is comfort? And if you ask any comfort scientist or comfort technician, uh, their first answer should always be, it depends. It depends on the ambient conditions that you're in. It depends on what you're wearing. It depends on what you had for dinner, what you had to drink, who's around you, what color you're wearing. It all depends. Um, if you look up the Webster's de def definition of comfort, it is defined as the lack of discomfort. So that doesn't really help anybody, right? So if I'm in this scenario and I'm sitting on that cliff, I'm going to be anxious. I'm not going to be comfortable. Although I'm 6'5", I'm afraid of heights. So I'm going to be freaking out. Um, so it really depends on the scenario that you're in. Uh, from there, you take that the lack of discomfort. So if we're doing our other jobs here, um, we're making sure that you don't notice our garments. The human body can only perceive when it's uncomfortable. Um, you have a learned cognitive skill to know when you're uncomfortable or when you're comfortable. Um, when you're uncomfortable, you're either too hot or too cold. That's the only time your body can perceive if you're comfortable or not is when you're uncomfortable. Um, so if we're doing our job, you'll forget that you're wearing our garments. Um, you'll be focused on the task at hand, whether it's avalanche rescue or just hiking up the mountain, uh, soaking in the ambiance of the scenery. You'll forget that you're wearing our materials. And that's truly our goal, to make sure you're comfortable, to make sure you forget that you're wearing your Gore-Tex jacket. And then you remember the next time when you go out in the field to put it on because you were so comfortable when you were wearing it. And we have a very... We've invested very heavily into some facilities here um, at Gore um, in our biophysics lab capability. And biophysics, biophysics is just a rebranding of what we called our old comfort lab. Uh, there's really three main facets. The biophysics lab where the bench top testing is, the rain tower, which you see here, which is, allows us to uh, expose our materials to a quarter inch of rain up to about three inches of rain um, per hour. We can control the air temperature from 5C to 25C or roughly 40F to 80F. So you can go from a cool winter's rain to a warm summer's rain and really evaluate how the introduction of moisture to the surface of our materials can affect breathability and insulation. As well out dry out times, whatever you can think of, we can engineer an experiment to mimic the end use application. Uh, from there, we go into our state of the, state of the art environmental chamber, a one of a kind build. Um, there are many different environmental chambers in the world. This is the only one that we are aware of that can control temperature, humidity, solar, and wind. Uh, we can go from minus 50 to plus 50 C or minus 58 F to 122 F. Uh, roughly all of the relative humidity scales, uh, solar radiation is up to 1100 uh, meters per square watt um, and wind up to about 20 miles an hour. So this is a really unique tool to have where I get to play weatherman or God whenever I'd like uh, to make sure that we're eliminating variables from the real world, uh, because there's no such thing as a comfort field trial, only a durability field trial. We really need to understand the physics of the ambient and the microclimate and the materials that you have in between them to understand what's going on and have a working knowledge of what our materials are going to do in that end use. Um, and that's kind of where we get into our comfort science philosophy, our testing pyramid, where we're looking at our raw materials when they come into the door um, and we're testing them in the benchtop area. Uh, from there, we move into the laminate testing after we have processed and made our materials inside of our facilities and see what changes we've made to them. And then from there, we move into the system level and user level tests. Um, so all to be able to provide a differentiated value, right? The R&D work that we're doing right now, this material is better than the one we had previously, be able to explain why that is and be able to stand by what, whatever product claims that we have. And we do that mostly with tests on the material and um, laminate level on hot plates, right? So you may have heard of RCT or RET or evaporative resistance or thermal resistance. It's really just measuring the resistance of the material on top of that plate and then back calculating what those resistances are. So higher the insulation, the better. If you're looking to stay warm, lower the evaporation uh, rate, the better. That means the more breathable the material is. So that's a very important tool to have to weed out some ideas that Sarah may be working through uh, to really speed up the R&D cycle when we're doing our testing back here in the lab. And from there, we get into our uh, system level test where we're making those materials into a closer to end use product. So thermal sweating foot, thermal hand, we have our sweating thermal articulated mannequin. Uh, these are basically just hot plates in human form. So it's very important to understand that final form of these garments uh, because things like 
pockets and seam tape and zippers can all affect the performance of that garment. Um, if you're in an avalanche, you normally have one of those avalanche beacons in some, inside some of those jackets. That's a great tool to have and you need that, but that's going to be blocking that area for breathability. So really understanding the garment design is important to what we're doing. Um, so like I said, if you have that RET in the laminate level, nice and low, it's great. You turn it into a garment and you factor in the air gaps and the different product features. It can really increase the breathability numbers, which is not a good thing. And RET you, or RE, you want to have the lower the value, the better, which means there's less resistance being provided by that material. So the more breathable it would be. From there, we get into some system level modeling. We take all of these inputs from the testing that we're doing, um, metabolic rates for work protocols, um, the environmental temperatures, and we throw them into our models. We have a world-class modeling team uh, within Gore that can then predict the performance of those materials when it comes to skin temperature, core temperature, you name it, uh, how, how long you could expect to be inside the, uh, in the field wearing those garments. From there, we get into the human subject testing after the modeling. So we wanna make sure that we're confirming the results that we're finding in our models. So we'll mimic the end use application to those same work protocols by the metabolic rate. We use skin temperature and humidity sensors and heart rate monitors to capture all that physical data from the subjects. Um, we also have core temperature pills that you swallow um, to make sure that your, your core temperature is not seeking too far into hypothermic or hypothermic scenarios. So all in really important tools to have to understand how the human body is going to work, how it's going to perceive the differences in our materials and how we can hopefully protect you in that end use. So we have really invest, invested heavily in these, in these labs to make sure that we can test our products to what we say they're gonna do, right? Uh, on our wall here, we have a very, fun and famous quote, right? There's no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate clothing. And that's true for everyone, right? If you're not layered properly, it doesn't really matter what kind of safety gear and avalanche gears and shovels that you have. If you're not properly dressed when that weather turns on you, you're gonna be in trouble. So we're trying to make sure that people are educated about what to wear, how to wear, and how to help the, our materials make them feel more comfortable, or should I say less uncomfortable when they're out in the field. And I think Christy's got some nice slides yeah. coming up here for you guys. Yeah. Hey, guys, it's Christy. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about male versus female physiology. Um, I first want to kind of acknowledge, um, you know, there are some I'm going to use male and female quite a lot. Um, there are some people that don't fall into these categories. Um, so I just wanted to kind of say that up front that we recognize that. Um, and I also want to recognize Prasanna. Uh, Prasanna is on Ray's team, and he and I have kind of partnered. Um, do, um, he's been scouring a bunch of comfort studies and um, literature, trying to find this information. And I've always been interested on kind of how men and female are different. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of um, female friends that we always seem to be cold, and our male friends and coworkers don't. So just always very intrigued on some of the differences. So I, you know, Prasanna and I got together and um, we wanted to share some of the things that we thought were pretty interesting as we looked at uh, the comfort studies out there. So just to kind of, you know, reiterate what Ray shared with you, um, you know, your body's job is really keeping it at 98 degrees. Um, and it's got a lot of things coming at it. You have sun, you've got wind, you've got cold, snow, rain, and really the job of your body is to keep it at 98 degrees. Um, you're comfortable when it's at that temperature um, and you're, you know, a lot of factors come into that. One of the um, things that we found that your heat loss gain um, depends on the surface area and the body volume of your body. Uh, Prasanna came across a um, study on the next slide that took 12 men, 12 women, um, and essentially they studied the surface area and the volume of, say, your lower legs, your thighs, your upper arms, your hands, and really compared the 12 men and the 12 women. 
on the right hand side is the surface area to volume of women versus men and you can see it's over one so in general women are smaller we tend to have more surface area so we are going to cool faster than men you know obviously there's differences some uh, women tend to be larger and vice versa um, but in general we found you know that there is a reason why women tend to feel colder. The other thing I thought interesting on the bottom, you can see um, the biggest differences are, is in our hands and our forearms. So, you know, our hands may feel colder than our male counterparts um, sooner. Want to spend a little bit of time talking about how our body responds in warm and cold conditions. Uh, because I'm going to use the words quite a bit. Um, the first one is vasodilation. Um, and essentially is, you know, you're really active. Um, Dan mentioned you're shoveling, you know, your heart out. Um, and you're really active and you're sweating a lot. And your body's responding. Your brain is recognizing that skin temperature difference. And you start to sweat, uh, which is a good thing. You know, sweating only helps if it actually can evaporate and take heat with it. Um, so you want to sweat, but, you know, the good news is you want to sweat, but you want to get through your clothing system. Uh, you don't want to get your clothing system dry or um, wet. So keep ventilating, take off layers. Um, the second condi condition we talk about is vasoconstriction. Um, so as your body cools, um, your core will cool. It will draw blood from your extremities, your fingers, your toes to protect your core. Um, that we. Uh, refer to that as vasoconstriction. So these are natural. You want them to happen. Don't fight them. They actually um, help you stay safe in cold and hot environments. Your body could also shiver. And the purpose of shivering is using your muscles to actually generate heat. Um, so you do want that to happen as well. So when we started looking at sweating, we didn't see a whole lot of differences. Uh, women and men tend to sweat at the same rates, despite the cooling differences that we saw. Um, we definitely saw a difference between larger uh, people versus smaller, um, but we didn't see that it really depended on gender. One thing that we thought was found that was interesting in one study is that women tend to sweat on the upper part of our back. You'll see in that red circle there, whereas men tend to sweat in the lower part of their back. Uh, so we thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, and I think one of the guys, when we were talking about this, brought this up, you know, maybe wearing a vest that you can take on and off makes a whole lot of sense. And the benefit of comfort mapping garments so you can, you know, release the sweat in your upper uh, back or your lower back. The one thing that um, a lot of people don't talk about because uh, anyway, not as comfortable with it, but in general, depending on your monthly cycle, um, towards the end, the last two weeks of your cycle, your body's producing progesterone. That means your temperature is raising about 0.3 degrees um, for those two weeks. Um, and then it'll jump back down um, to the beginning of your cycle. If you're taking oral contraceptives, that means your body temperature is stable, but it is raised at that higher luteal uh, phase. Um, so, you know, when women are exposed, you know, to cold temperatures towards the end of the cycle, that means they're gonna respond, they're gonna feel it sooner, they're gonna put on more layers, they're just gonna feel colder. Um, so I, we thought that was interesting. It's also a reason why you may not see as many studies with women versus men, because it does just complicate things. Um, there definitely are studies, but um, it does complicate things because using you have to compensate for what part of the cycle the female is in. One thing that was um, came out quite a bit was Raynaud's syndrome. I don't know if anyone's uh, familiar with it, but it's like a significant reduced blood flow. We talked about vasoconstriction. You know, when you get cold your body responds by taking blood from your fingers or your toes. For some people, it's most prevalent among females, but males definitely have it. It's called Raynaud syndrome. And essentially it's like a severe um, where your fingers actually turn white 
Um, it's really hard to reverse it as well. So if you're in the cold and you know your fingers turn white, you have to get pretty warm to reverse it. Um, we don't understand why more women have it than men, um, but it is definitely very common. And I'm sure some of the females um, on this call probably have experienced rhinos. I know Dan Cawthorn, right? Um, he said he has it quite a bit when he's out in cold weather. And then finally, we talked, I know Ray touched on um, the importance of staying dry. And before I worked for Gore, I never realized um, that your body loses heat 20 times faster when your clothing is wet versus dry. And that's such a big number. Um, you know, it, it's so important to keep dry, not just from rain and snow, but also from making sure your layers are breathable, that sweat's able to evaporate and move through the layers um, and keep you comfortable in cold conditions. Thank you, Christy. That's a great segue into the final segment we have here before we'll get into some questions and hopefully answers. So I'm going to talk about basically leveraging the input and science that Ray and Christy talked through and how we implement this into an actual uh, product or a hard shell that you all hopefully have familiarity using. So you heard a lot about comfort, so I won't dwell on all of those details, but I, I will emphasize the, the aspect about being comfor comfortable and protected, and that includes both on the inside and the outside. Um, at Gore, we take pride in understanding the entire system and how it works. Um, of course, layering is really important when it comes to outdoor clothing. It's not all about the hard shell and it's not all about your base layer. However, with respect to what we can control and what we want to focus on supplying to our consumers and professionals like yourselves, is around that hard shell and what it can do both from the inside in terms of keeping you comfortable and from the outside and keeping you protected. So on the inside, um, we really focus on the backer. So in a either a three layer system as we call it, um, or even a two layer system with a liner, we try to really help the consumer push the sweat, the output that you're working on the inside out of the system as quickly as possible. So Ray emphasized breathability and the importance of moving moisture from the inside, from what you're generating to the outside. And then on the contrary, on the outside of the garment, we focus on um, the science and, and textiles related to protecting you from getting getting wet. So there are elements that we provide on this, this slide specifically highlighting DWR. We know that the use of DWR, a durable water repellency, that's the, the acronym DWR, um, treated on top of a textile will help with protecting you from uh, feeling wet but then there's also the membrane on the inside that protects you from getting wet. So there's this balance of knowing we need to ensure that water is not staying on the outer textile, um, which can make you feel wet. And then there's an inner layer, which is really the critical aspect of protecting you from, from actually getting wet from your base layer or your skin from feeling wet. Um, you all have probably experienced times in your life, whether you're wearing um, a long sleeve shirt or you know you get caught up in the rain. And if your your garment does not have DWR, you will immediately um, sense the the textile getting wet, sticking to your skin, feeling clammy. Um, so we really. Um, want to highlight the importance of how we apply a DWR, 
but also the importance as a consumer to care for your garment. Um, DWR is not something that will last for a long, long time without proper care. So we want to make sure to emphasize to you all here why we have the opportunity that washing and drying your garment is very important. Um, it gets rid of contaminants that you're exposed to in the field and um, also rejuvenates um, some of the important uh, chemistries that, that we're incorporating into our fabrics. And then we, as, as Ray was mentioning, it's a system. So it's not just the fabric that's going into these jackets. Um, we take a lot of pride and um, also put a strong importance on how to construct the fabric into a garment that at the end will keep you dry. Um, so Gore-Tex does stand behind a guarantee to keep you dry warranty with our brand partners. We work closely with them and, and the factories constructing the garments to ensure that the seams are constructed in a way that will keep water out, that the pockets are in placements and constructed in ways that will keep the water out. And depending on what type of Gore-Tex product you purchase, it, has, it may have a different criteria in terms of the ability and the amount, um, the duration essentially of, of what we're certifying. So you see listed here, um, we have a rain test, which is very harsh, I think, um, in, in most conditions. And then we have a storm test that's extreme, uh, which you all probably are exposed to um, both of these settings and the line of work and, and the exposure, it sounds like you're, you're going out in and having to go out in. So we want to make sure that we're not only supplying a fabric, but we're supplying a system that can protect you in, in the harshest of conditions that you're faced. And we make sure we certify our garments and our brand partners um, are required to, to submit any Gore-Tex jacket to um, abide by one of these tests and make sure that we're meeting our standards. And Dan, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you for the closer yeah. here. Thanks, Sarah. So just a couple other things here before we jump into the Q and A. Um, even though there's many things similar about us and our physiology, um, still everyone's different and went through midwinter body size, fiber preference, you know, for it's a, it's a system, right, of clothing. Uh, and we, we focus on the hard shell, like Sarah said, but you know, you've got a lot of choices of, you know, wool, synthetics, even cotton for a system that, that keeps you dry from the inside and the outside. So it takes a little, it takes a little work to find out what is best for you. And again, you know, for um, the, the avalanche, um, you know, forecast digging pits, um, the, the, the rescue protocol, skinning uphill, you go for extreme heat buildup to stopping and cold. So even having, um, uh, you know, insulating jacket that goes over the top of everything. You know, I, I think, you know, over the years, it's, it's been found that actually having that warm jacket that goes on top, so you never have to take Gore-Tex off. So you, you don't get wet from that act of just taking off a jacket. Um, so, and, and the, the, all this is done in the context of keeping yourself safe because, you know, first rule is do no more harm in a situation like an avalanche rescue. Um, so you got to take care of yourself first, which means knowing your body and how to, how to dress accordingly. So that's it from our side here. And, um, questions? All right, I'm just looking at the chat now. Well, people from everywhere, cool. All right, do we have any questions in the chat? I'm, it's instead of me just sitting here staring. It's so quiet, I can barely hear. Speakers 50. 
Well, that's a big pill to swallow. <laughs> yeah, do you wanna kinda, I mean, Ray, do you wanna kinda go over what's happening with the human subject testing and the big pill <laughs> that pill. we're swallowing? It's always a showstopper on the in-person tours as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's about the size of a large antibiotic pill. It, what it is is a radio transmitter that sits down in your gut that you take six hours before your trial. Um, and then that radio signal will transmit to the receiver and tell you what the core temperature is. Um, it's important to take it about six hours before the trial. So any introduction of hot or cold liquids doesn't influence the reading, um, but it's also the easiest and most pleasant way of monitoring core temperature, um, especially on the hot side where heat stroke is, can be less than one degree C away uh, in a core temperature shift. Um, it's very important to understand what's going on on a real time basis. Uh, and that allows us to do that. Other methods are pretty invasive. Uh, the worst being the esophageal probe where you snort the sensor up your nose and it comes down and sits in your esophagus. Um, plus you would need to have a medical doctor on staff to administer that. This I can just throw off to somebody before they come in the next day. And then are you also just asking like, hey, are you comfortable or is it purely just? So while they're doing a subject trial, there's going to be survey questions uh, on iPads that they have inside the chamber that they'll answer on a sliding scale to the most comfortable, the least comfortable they've ever been, um, and trying to blind them to these results as much as possible. Um, it could be any question that we're trying to look at, whether it's, uh, you know, the, a shoe's too tight, uh, the jacket has good range of movement, um, whatever the end use application is looking to maximize the uh, performance in, we can, you know, and then give a biased question or an unbiased question to get the answers that we're trying to figure out. And then I see a question from Melinda. Yep, I can answer that one. Hi, Melinda. So this study wasn't one that Gore did. Um, and one thing that I can include, Prasanna looked at a number of different studies. I don't know that one in particular, but I can, I know we have a page of references. If you want, we could share that if it would be of interest, but it was somebody else, you know, another group that picked 12. So I'm not sure why they did. I can answer that a little bit too for some of the in-house subject tests. Um, it depends uh, on what we're doing. <laughs> Favorite comfort answer, right? So uh, for something that's specific like fire safety service, we're gonna go look for specific firefighters that are used to wearing those garments. Um, then we have the more traditional like backcountry gear where it could be a weekend warrior or it could be a professional that's wearing that. Um, we're going to look for a average roundabout um, distribution of subject sizes, right? We're trying to eliminate that variable between the subjects by using the, the metabolic rate. Um, so Christy, for example, is a lot smaller than I am. I'm six foot five, 250 pounds. Um, for her to put out the same amount of energy that I would, she would have to walk much faster on a treadmill or a steeper incline than I would. So we're eliminating those variables as much as we can to get some of those uh, physiological and perceptional responses. Um, but in the more medical studies, um, they typically are gonna do the same thing and, and try to make sure that everyone's working at that same metabolic rate. There's actually standards for every activity that you can think of from making a bed, to digging a shovel, to scuba diving, you name it, whatever the activity is, there's a standard metabolic rate associated with that activity uh, that is used for all subject trials. Uh, we have from Bree, I don't know who out of this group wants to chat about it. Um, I'm curious if you can speak to differences between Gore-Tex technology versus something like H2NO, or another water repellent outdoor fabric? I can try. <laughs> I knew it was Dan. <laughs> so uh, Gore-Tex is, a, and I think there was another question about our different materials oh. and what's unique. Uh, so Gore-Tex is a, a membrane that's a PTFE with polyurethane together um, that's sandwiched in between a, a face fabric, which is typically nylon and a backer material if it's, um, uh, three-layer product. Um, the main difference that we have though, you know, H2NO or other water repellents tend to be coatings. So they tend to be just a polyurethane film um, that's that's is here to the face fabric and or a backer. Um, the difference with 
just from the technology point of view with Gore-Tex is that PTFE structure that holds it together. And that provides this durable waterproofness. It's really one of the big differences. It's almost like having um, rebar in concrete. Uh, without the rebar, concrete will just uh, fracture and break into pieces. Um, and it's very similar with polyurethanes too. Without a structure in there, um, it'll crumble you know, with, with repeated washing and stuffing in a pack and taking out of a pack. So that's one of the biggest differences of all is just the, uh, the durability that comes from that PTFE scaffolding, if you want to call it that, that's inside there. Thanks, Dan. And then I think I, somebody's hand was up, but then I don't know if you want to unmute yourself or type it in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, we have another question. Um, any idea how the team developed the model to predict the performance? So anyone want to kind of go over? Um, I'm thinking like the stress testing and how that. So it depends. Lee, come on. You got to get this answer down. Uh, oh, yeah. It depends. It, it depends. <laughs> yeah. So like all of these materials are going to go through our different labs, whether it's the durability lab, the quality control lab, shade lab, or the biophysics lab. Um, so we're going to be testing these very stringently on everything you can think of. Um, we have a world-class modeling team here, right? So they get, they take some of the data that we create um, through the, our testing and they can predict the performance for something like how many cycles do we expect this material to last before it cracked. Um, or on the comfort side of things, it's more along the physiological response of how the body is going to predict. Um, so if this material has a breathability rating of, of seven um, and an insulation rating or a, a point through two, you can then predict how quick that the body's gonna warm up um, in those predictive models. Way above my pay grade. That's why Gore employs the world-class modeling team. Thanks, Ray. It depends. It depends. <laughs> um, and then if anyone sees uh, Suzanne's question, to wearing a chest protector, do you re recommend wearing it on the inside or the outside of your Gore-Tex gear? Anyone from this team? I have a dumb question. What's exactly, what's a chest protector? I'm, and, yeah. Can I, can I, I'll answer. I'm the one who asked the question. There we go. So ah, <laughs> ah. in the snowmobiling world, we wear, um, chest protectors like a tech vest um, to prevent injury on whether or not yep. you know you yep. want to slam into the handlebars and there's a lot of debate out there on whether it's best to wear it underneath your jacket or on the outside so um, you were talking about breathability you know the beacon blocking breathability so it raises a huge question about the chest protector yeah so I've I've done many studies with different uh, protection, whether it's ballistic um, or snowmobiling stuff. Um, when you're wearing those, they're needed, right? It's that fitness for use type of the application where it doesn't matter what you're doing, you need to wear them. Um, they're going to block that breathability area um, unless they're pretty perforated. I've seen some pretty perforated chest protectors as well in the past. Um, they're going to block most of the breathable area that when you're wearing this. Um, but the important thing to remember is the insulation. You don't, if it's an extremely cold environment, you don't want to compress that insulation at all. Um, so you're going to want to wear that closer to your body and where your loftier insulations on the outside. Um, and also if it's say, you know, snowmobiling, it shouldn't be raining too often, but if it is, um, those chest protectors can actually pick up some a, a pretty good amount of water weight as well. And then thus push the insulation down even further and make you potentially colder. Cool. I just learned something today. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Otherwise, I can definitely, I'll leave my email in the chat for you all. And then if you have any questions, feel free to reach out directly to me or Aziza. Um, and then I can always get in touch with the, the experts who know what they're talking about. <laughs> It's 
going to type it in here. Cool. Yeah. Um, I'll just echo Nancy. That was super cool. Um, super interesting to hear all the different science behind it and all the thought and effort that's gone into it. Um, so thank you all for being here and for sharing. You have super cool jobs, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us. We really appreciate yep. the time to be able to chat to all of you. And I'm so happy to hear you're all part of the Women's Mentorship Program as well. Really cool. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Oh, cool. Thank you.